to sell it if you're not going to get paid, and you're not going to be able to afford pizza to talk to other scientists. <laughs> <laughs> it's all circle of life here. Like just like a pizza. <laughs> Not a coincidence. Yeah. yeah, and it's called a pie. <laughs> it's a pizza pie. I, um, I definitely lean more towards entertaining than educating. I don't want to be giving my reader a science lesson, and I feel like you know my reader might already know my science. Um, so, um, but the, like, the downfall I have is um, in all of my work, sometimes it, it can be too technical, and then I have editors or readers be like, I don't know what you're talking about here. And so, you know, for me, um, to get into the mindset of someone who doesn't have the background and make it meaningful, not just understandable, but meaningful to them. Like, why should I care about this science? Or, you know, why should I care? How does it affect people? How does it affect the human, you know, human condition or, you know, the, the human heart, the choices we make? How does it change us? Um, so that's, that's what I'm interested in exploring, and I try to tell my reader enough to understand that and not every detail that I've researched while I was procrastinating actually writing the story. I like that phrase you use. How does it change the human heart? I'm at heart, but art is good too. No, I said heart. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you said heart. Yeah, how does it change yeah. your heart? That's, you know, how does it affect, that's... yeah, how does it touch you? Right. So, um, any favorite, like, what, what works do you admire that handle this, the science well? Like, what are your role models when you're, when you're creating? Well, I'll start because I have a favorite favorite. Um, the original, the 92, 94, I forget when it was published, uh, Jurassic Park launched a whole, you know, generation of, of biogeneticists, mm -hmm. right? So when it, when you ran through, you know, I spoke about this earlier, so people that came five minutes earlier, you're listening to me talk about this again, but, you know, when they, when they went through how, you know, DNA is recombined and where, you know, they pulled the the frog DNA and all of it wasn't great science, right? So this is a really interesting point. What what he suggested inside uh, Jurassic Park isn't available, isn't feasible, right? But it, it it's it spun a lot of people into that field just out of interest. And now we can do it. Yeah, now we can do it. Yeah. Really scary. Sort of. Well hopefully we're not gonna build the theme park. Well now it's even more broken, right? Yeah. So <laughs> well, the end of but what's interesting yeah, is they, they took some of the holes from the original in the in the new movie. They're like, you know, kind of acknowledging, you know, that you you know, you couldn't really make the, the dinosaurs the way the original movie said, and they're like, Oh yeah, we're filling in the gaps, so these aren't you know, these dinosaurs aren't like what they really were in nature, which makes for like different options and then actually that drove the plot because then you had this monster that was, you know, never never walked the earth before <laughs> and um you know, so it's interesting, like where the, the bad science or the holes in the science can can actually give you like more avenues for plot. There's this wonderful TED talk, and, and I don't know what the name for this this practice is, where they're taking DNA from museum exhibits, and like like the passenger pigeon, uh, and finding the next nearest living relative, and implanting those sequences in, in embryos and getting the passenger pigeon back. And they're doing this with, uh, there, there was a um, the Tasmanian tiger. Sure. Um, and you can do these things. We have the technology to do these things now. And the question is, what are we going, and, and that next up, mammoths. Sure. Well, and they're going to take chickens and make dinosaurs because it was a closely related. Well, that is, and that's the science that didn't quite yeah, you know, the sink. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, you, I think you're going to have to make a few stops along the way. Yeah, so we're retconning Mother Nature. Yeah, right? but, have, um, you know, but, but I mean, we, can, we can bring back the passenger pigeon, and we should because they're good eating. That's why they're gone now. <laughs> they're tasty. Um, <laughs> that's also a recent enough extinction that it wouldn't be a disaster to the biosphere the way some other things I might don't be. know that that's true, and this is the beautiful, this is where you start getting into, into, into the ethics of science. You know, just because, and, and, and I hate to put the line in the book, just because you can do, you can do something, should you do it? That's right on Jurassic Park. Is that on Jurassic Park? <laughs> Are we still I talking still about Jurassic Park? I stole from Michael Craig. Awesome. He's dead. He can't sue me. Um, <laughs> Jeff Goldblum says that in the movie. Does he? Well, I've always been a big fan of Jeff Goldblum. While they're eating um, fish. What um, kind of fish? Um, the one that's almost she, extinct, um, orange rocky. Well, that's kind of appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was proud um, that they chose that fish. 
fish. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Uh, two recent Peter Watts books, uh, Blind Sight and Echopraxia, for the science of the brain and group mind and how minds can be altered and his aliens. I get all kind of jumbled when I talk about his science because it's one of the hard science books that I really still read for character and I just am in awe of what he comes up with. If you get a chance to read Blind Sight and Echo Crack, I highly advise those books because they're just, I hope they make, I would love to see a mini series of movies out of those because he does some of the weirdest aliens and Good talks about I'll see I'll see I can vampires as, you know, it was a, um, an evolutionary dead end and he went ahead and brought them back and they're not the twinkly vampires. These are these are dangerous predators. Who, predators yeah. Because of something in their brain, he, he explains the reason why right angles wipe them out. It does something that triggers like epileptic seizures, and it's just it's just they're amazing books. I just love the heck out of them. So that's why if you get a chance to read Blind Sight and Echopraxia. I'm going to put a plug in for Embassy Town by Chana Mieville. And I've never met, I'm a big fan of his work. I've never met Chana Mieville, but I am convinced he wrote this book as a love letter to me. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I do cognitive psychology and psycholinguistics, and I'm sure anybody here would enjoy the book. But if, you, if you've done doctoral work in psycholinguistics, it's, it's at a whole other level. And it's just brilliant. And he's not doing, he's not necessarily showing science, but he's talking about linguistic science and, and some of the ramifications of it. And you have, an, you have aliens who may lack a concept, and they bring in humans, and so they don't have a word for a thing. And they don't, they only have, this group of people only have one language, but it's, it's language like with a capital L. And, to acquire a new concept, they have to have it modeled in front of them. And the humans on this colony, they, they hire this, this, this young woman, and they promise that there will be no lasting damage. And they put her in a room, and they starve her, and all of this is to make a concept. You know, the, the person who would not give us the things we wanted to know, or something. And in the course of the book, we find a number of people that have been living words for these aliens, including he who swims with the fishes, which was a fun joke to put in there. And they took this guy and they, they put him in a tank, and they wanted to get this idea. And the notion of somebody being a word in a language, just, you know. And it's so, it's at such right angles to the way we normally think, and to be able to express that and have the reader get it. Because normally if you, if you go, if, if something is truly alien, it's alien. You're not going to be able to grok it. You, you can't apprehend all the features of it, or even some of the features of it. So you have to go and pull just back from that. And you go, wow, what drugs are you taking that you can think of these things? And that's my experience of trying to be able to <laughs> go read Embassy Town. And, and I, I've given the barest piece of it to you there. So people like that understand Oh, everybody in this room should understand Groff. If you don't understand Groff, yeah. then you leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, read that, I read that book. I get some of the ideas no. you're talking about there. To Groff is a, a timeline word for understanding. In case you can well, stay. Understand the way that changes your view. Yes. Right. Deep good. understanding, special yeah. understanding. How about our film and TV writer? Like, what is what is your inspiration in terms of like researching it and getting it right? I, I really did love The Martian. I thought they did okay, a great yeah. job. I mean, they they made some leaps, but I think they handled it in such a way. And in that same way that the Jurassic Park inspired people to, to be interested in you know the very small things going on in our bodies, this I think is going to get people interested in space. Yeah. And get people back thinking that you know. A possible colony on Mars is possible within our lifetime. I'm already seeing it. Um, it so, it's it's yeah. it's amazing. And it's so. done wonders for potato futures. It, it, <laughs> that's it. That's it. Made me so hungry for potatoes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I thought I thought that not was so much fantastic. disco music, but uh. and again, part of that is just because you, you see this this emotional story with this guy, and you you they. 
they give you the science, they give you the sense of it, it, it being grounded in a, it feels like a real world, it feels, you know, like it's there, but. That, that's a great example of a novel and, and even of a movie where science is a character. It is. And, and even more so in, in a novel because there's almost no characterization. It's a very weak character story, but you don't care because it's all about the science. Uh, the movie does a little better job of it because you've got an actor everybody wants to look at, so that helps. Yeah, and Andy Weir is not a scientist, right? He um, had a short story published that you know got a fair amount of interest, and then he had this opportunity, you know, to to pursue this thing that was interesting to him, and he, he built The Martian around that idea of just his interest in, in making this happen. I don't know. If there's a moment. It, it's not a spoiler at this point. You've always had the chance to read the movie or see the book. The moment when he remembers and realizes the Mars rover is up there. Yeah. I wanted to sing. <laughs> it is so great. Yeah. That's great. the Broadway musical version. Of the yes. Rover! Yeah. 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 That's my part. Rover! It's curious. the all Bowie movie. I'm just curious when he has that moment where he realizes the Mars rover is there. That's where I was thinking, I might not have been able to go there. Because it's 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 the sort of thing that you know this is the this is the sort of thing you, you, you aspire to, I think, when you're writing aliens or you're writing future. You don't want to have to explain the things that are odd to us, because they're not odd to the people in that setting. And forgotten techno forgotten sp space missions fall into that. They're just there. They're in the background. Nobody needs to point that out to you. It's like if you, if you suddenly needed lead, and you were in an old tenement, you said, wait a minute. The paint! <laughs> you know? And, 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 every, and everybody would go, Fuck yes, the paint! <laughs> but you're not gonna, as you know, Bob, prior to the, the OSHA statute of you know, whatever. And, and that's what makes it work. Because it's effortless. Because or you it's, could it's, take it's, a trip to Flint. Too soon, too soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question that Chris, Christine inspired when you met brought vampires is have any of you used science to justify something that was basically a bullshit concept to make it real or make it plausible? When you're copying and pasting, right, out of, of scientific doctrine to, to, to convince the audience that it's legit, then you're making a mistake. Doesn't every every science fiction writer do the scientific explanation of vampirism? Or zombieism. Or zombieism. Or zombieism. Or zombieism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. well, that's, um, but you can or or lycanthropism like and uh, yeah. I've yeah. never read a good book that, that tried that, right? No one said anything about good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it just a metaphor for a virus? It's going to destroy so, us yeah. all. Okay, World but War Z. See, a World War Z? But the, yes. the, the, the viral version of it, that's that's new. Like, it, it, that was not the explanation for a long time. It, that it, You can watch the explanation for zombies and vampires kind of change and morph through time. Like yeah. the original uh, Night of the Living Dead, it's not, it's, it's no, more, it's a, a satellite yeah. basically that crashes. Right. So it's mm -hmm. it's exposure to cosmic rays that is the thing, because at the time we were more concerned about nuclear panic than viruses. I believe now, the Fantastic Four. Now it's viruses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's the, and it's the same thing there. Like that was, a sp in the new movie, they don't travel into space. It's not cosmic rays. It's like interdimensional travel. So it's like each each new frontier sort of changes our explanation for the thing that's scaring us. Then Matthias and Reagan's novel back in the 60s, I seem to remember a movie version with Vincent Price. Oh, well, th there have been like six versions of, of you're talking about Iron Legend. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and that was yeah. viral. Uh, so maybe it's not as old as... With, um, yeah. Yeah, that was on on on. Maybe it's not that. It wasn't. There wasn't. There was the Vincent Price, and then there was the Omega Man, and then there was the Will Smith. So um, let's see. We're getting down to like about ten minutes left, and we have time for questions. Um, and I'm also curious how many people here are writers. How many are coming here? Like, are anybody a writer? Mm -hmm. So looking for. How you know, many like pizza? How many like pizza? <laughs> <laughs> so Carl Sagan went to Kip Thorne and said, here's a pizza, build me a time machine. That's how it happened. <laughs> okay. just, just like that. All just right. Exactly like that. Okay. 
uh, question? Sure. Really basic one. What was the name of that book you were talking about? Embassy Town by Chani Mieville. Thank you. Calvin Lawrence sent, 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 sent you. And then I accept his love letter. <laughs> <laughs> Any other hard science uh, authors you'd recommend? Your Benson's my favorite. I, I, I don't tend to read a lot of them, because I'm a social scientist, you know. I'm, I'm not one of those squishy therapy types. But, you know, I'm, I'm doing hypothesis testing following the same models that, that Newton laid out, in, you know, in, in, but, but I'm, doing, I'm working with people instead of, you know, inanimate objects or, or stars or some such. Um, so I'm looking for more like anthropological science fiction, linguistic science fiction, psychological science fiction. The physics and the chemistry are so far behind in my education that, you know, I'll, I'll, if Greg says it's so, okay, but I don't want to read a story about, you know, and, and the eccentric orbit of this satellite, you know, it's like, dude, where's the story? Um, though, uh, Niven had this wonderful thing in, in one of his stories where, um, I guess it's Beowulf Schaefer, uh, or Louis Wu, I don't remember which. The puppeteers have an issue, and and what it comes down to is they don't understand tides. Neutron star. Neutron, Neutron star. star. Thank you. Uh, and from this, he deduces that we, you know nobody knows where the, where the puppeteer homeworld is, but he knows you don't have a moon. And then they pay him off, uh, and that's neat. And and, 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 and and Niven did a lot of little things. You take one piece of science and and run with it. But he also had the rotation of the ring world going the wrong way in the first edition. So. They fixed it, but... <laughs> Any other recommendations, hard science authors? I've got a recommendation, um, if people are looking to add the next kind of book in their stable, um, there is a, a wonderful, and it's not too long, it's, it's doable, uh, Bill Bryson's Brief History of Everything um, is the, you know, is a, a fictionalized, you know, account of, of science through the progression of man. Um, so if you have something that you have an idea about and you want to push something forward, start there to get a, a scope on what you want to do. I kind of assume everyone's already read, uh, reading him already, but Oliver Sacks is beautiful if you haven't been reading Oliver, if you're not reading Oliver Sacks. Uh, that's that? Oliver Sacks. He's a writer and neuroscientist. He exactly was. Was, yes. Mm -hmm. S-A-X? Uh, yes. There's a yes. lot of podcasts. No, S-A-C-K-S. No, C -C 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 -S. Radio Labs on him. Yeah, he, he's, he was a wonderful person and he was absolutely fascinated with the human brain and how it works and how it makes us who we are and what things that happen to it and I don't know. They're, and, they're all beautiful. And stories. a lot of bad yeah. movies came out of his came out of his fiction. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, but but like that, that same token, you know, go go online and watch TED Talks. You know, pick any subject, you know, and you're gonna go, whoa. I think TED Talks could just replace most universities. Right? <laughs> they really could. Yeah. Question? So I'm a computer geek, and you know, I run some local computer club, and I'm trying to convince the cons and such to have computer geeks come in and talk with the writers and try to get you know some. So so the other reverse thing is you know science and and computer people and things like that pushing into the writers. I just wonder if you guys are seeing that. Do you think that's a you know bad idea or whatever? In part what? So, you know, telling you about, well, you know, when you're doing cyber warfare, here's how networking works. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think the, the writers who are going to get it right go out and find these people on their own and bring pizza. them pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a running gag. Unless you have, you know, a few million dollar budget and they just come to you. Yeah. Right? So. David Brin is, is another example of someone who is out there making a lot of noise. Uh, making nice speaker fees. Uh, I don't know that the science necessarily ends up that solid in his books, but he's more interested in taking a scientific idea and then running, you know, way far with it. Uh, and that could be kind of neat. Uh, and and he's an interesting person to read, and, and, and he's all over the place with it, with it, with uh, his science fiction. I have a question. I, in addition to other degrees, I have an MBA. And when I was, when we were studying some of the social sciences in the MBA, the people that have the background in economics and finance, they don't even consider the social sciences real. What do you think of that? But 
they're like, what? Those numbers aren't even real. Some people feel that way about economists. I know. Okay. So it's like, how how exact is your science, my science, and more exact than your science? And I mean, you work back from what quantum physics and go all the way down. And you know, the chemists write about the biologists, the biologists write about the gen. Stop. Okay. There are some. So it's also be in the hard sciences, is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. One of the things you see in academia when the students come in. And I, I want to be an astrophysicist. And then they quickly discover they can't handle the math. Uh, and they say, well, so I'm going to be a chemist. And then they can't handle the chemistry. I'm going to be a biologist. And when they can't handle the biologist, they say, I'm going to be a psychologist. And when they can't handle that, they say, I'm going to be a sociologist. You know, and eventually, there are history majors. Uh, there are different kinds of rigor. Uh, and there are different things that all are doing science. But the, the learning curve is harder and steeper in some fields than in others. But in terms of how one does science, uh, it's the same underlying Thank concepts you. in physics, in chemistry, okay. in research psychology, uh, in sociology, in anthropology. We're all, and it, go, it goes back to, to Newton laying out these rules. This is the null hypothesis. The this is the ultimate method. hypothesis. Yeah. This is the scientific method. Right. And yeah, and then you tweak it a little bit depending on what you're working with. I'm also doing qualitative research. I mean, I just I have a BS in chemistry, but it, but it was synthetic organic work, and the P chemists, the physical chemists, used to make fun of the organic synthetic chemistry because we were just cookbook chemists. We just threw things in a pot and we made stuff, and they understood all the math behind it. But then they would work out all the math and say, well, you should be able to do this, this, and this, and you know, my research advisor would say. You can't do this. So sometimes the math and yeah. what you could actually do in the vessel didn't match up. So well, every chemist I ever worked with, you know, organic chemistry is the top is the hardest. You know, in physical chemistry, it's 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 all just glassware. You know, it's all just it's all just numbers. There's no it doesn't have the same creative drive behind it. Well, I bet a lot of those physical chemists wish they were organic chemists now. So. And by the way, where would marketing be without qualitative? Analysis. Which goes back to Gibb, right? So yeah. everything's computer science now, right? We no yeah. longer have anybody using an abacus. Big data. It's yeah. just, it's just data faster data. abacus. Well, it's time. we're getting down to the last minutes. Are there uh, maybe one more question from the audience? One in the back? Uh, Bill Bryson book, what's the title of that? Uh, Brief History of Nearly Everything, I believe. Uh, 2001, give or take. Wonderful. Probably my favorite ever. My favorite ever. Really? Yeah. That's a good endorsement. Yeah. Still alive too. <laughs> so and, still making books. And the author of was it Blindsight and Echopraxis? Echopraxia. E C A. Praxia. Okay. Yeah. E C H O P R A X I A. And oh, the I author, spelled it right when I wrote it down. <laughs> Peter Watt. I don't know if he has an S on the end of his name. I think it's Peter Watt or Peter Watts. It's Peter Watts. Peter Watts. Yeah. Thank you. Question. Man, you will never see this convention. So, I suspect people in here, if they don't already know, might be interested in Free Fall by Mark Stanley, it's a webcomic, and XKCD, oh, also a webcomic. XKCD. If you know oh, what XKCD. XKCD. It's, it's, maybe, it's probably it's maybe the best, like, hard science, not hard science, not science fiction book I've read in the last year. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's so good. It's really good. It's like, it's a page, he, he take because he's, he is a, a a physicist by training, and he's, he takes these crazy questions like, what would happen if you took a baseball and threw it at nearly the speed of light? <laughs> and he takes the question seriously and then works through, okay, well, ignoring how you would get it up to that speed, what would it mean? What would, it, what would the friction do to it? And what would, and then traces out these things on, on all these crazy what ifs and, and takes the, the science very seriously. Does he do the car? I'm oh, sorry? Does he do the one about the car? Which one? You're, driving, you're in a car and your car is driving at the speed of light? What happens when you turn on the headlights? It does not do that. It's not enough energy in the universe to resist the black holes. Well, this is a German car. Oh, All right. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you, Daniel, Christine, George, Lawrence. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for doing it. And enjoy the rest of the car.